you see highlighted in black the period that Peter's devoting to Marcus Aurelius. He was one of two adopted sons of Antoninus Pius and the condition for Antoninus Pius to be emperor was that Hadrian said that Pius had to adopt these two boys. It turned out to be very convenient and in many ways for Rome very useful but there was one significant problem in the raising and adopting of these two boys, Aurelius and Lucius Ferris. The big problem was that neither of the two kids ever left Italy while Antoninus Pius was alive. And because of that, they had no military experience. Pius himself was content, as was already explained, to guard what Hadrian had done, not make any innovation, just perpetuate it, and they have strict fiscal control and other control over the affairs of the Roman Empire, delegating any fighting to his legates, which was efficient and in many ways helpful, but an emperor needs to have some kind of understanding of military affairs and while Pius himself had an understanding of it he didn't have experience and in, in training his adopted sons he should have trained them in military experience because he didn't send them out with the legates these boys with Aurelius dying here and um, Pius dying about 10 years prior or 20 years prior 11 years prior. Um, because of that, a lot of problems happened during their reign. And that's why this text in Peter is so, I don't know, almost heartbreaking. Okay, you've got two, see, this, this is the typical Greek thing here that he's doing. You have split screen TV. What the Christian who's actually growing in Christ ought to be thinking during a specific time period that kind of governs the character of the time versus what the apostate Christians are going to be doing during that time versus what the pagans are going to be doing at that time and the the drama here is that if you're pursuing if you're pursuing the faith meaning Bible doctrine during this time all this stuff is going to be a value to you for the whole period okay even if you don't die even while you're just on the ground living, no matter how miserable or happy your physical circumstances might be. But by the same token for everybody else who's not living and learning on Bible, they're gonna think that they're accomplishing great things and everything they get is dust. That's the theme from Paul, really from Genesis to Revelation. And Peter is focusing on a particular emperor here, Marcus Aurelius, one of the emperors that even those in the West have, you know, wanted to emulate. They, pri they pr praise him a lot. This guy accomplished nothing. And it's really sad what happens during his time. So hopefully I can highlight it enough. And then, of course, you know, you can look up in these links, the contemporaneous history Okay, and the, you know, Roman historians, you know, university websites, etc. How they characterize this time. Okay, Aurelius will die in 180. He comes to power in 161. He dies in 180. And in his particular case, he no sooner comes to power, having his own faith in Greek philosophy, specifically Plato. Okay. He considers himself a philosopher. That's why Hadrian picked him. Okay, he comes, he, he was adopted by Pius when he was like 17 years old, and he was already considering himself a Greek philosopher at that time. And there was a lot of merit in the boy, and that's why they wanted him. By the time he comes to power here, it's 161. Okay, <clears throat> and the first year 
he's in office. It gets worse after this. The very first year he's in office, Parthia revolts during this time. Now he has no military experience. Neither did his co-emperor, this is the first time there are co-emperors, neither did his co-emperor brother, Lucius Verus. Okay? I mean, Verus wasn't exactly his brother, but close enough. I mean, legally they were considered brothers. Okay, so all of his faith and his philosophy did not help him when it came to putting down the Parthian revolt under Volagensis, okay? Parthia revolted because it was taking advantage of Pius's death. And, and it, in this case, um, Marcus Aurelius sent his brother, Lucius Verus, into Syria to try to revolt against, Par you know, to try and stel stem the revolt against Parthia. And, and Verus himself was not successful, but the other generals that were there were successful because Verus didn't have any experience. He was just there as a figurehead. Now here's what's so devastating about that. Yeah, okay, they won over Volgensis. They put their own nominee on the throne, okay? But you know what the troops brought back? Plague. There was a plague that the troops carried with them on the way back to Rome. And when they got to Rome, the plague just hit like wildfire. And from this time forward in Roman history, that plague is going to break out again and again and again and again. It's possible that Varus, you know, eventually died of it, and it's also possible that Marcus Aurelius eventually died of it. Now, the story that you see of Aurelius, which is in, you know, common myth, like in the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe, where it has... Commodus killing Marcus Aurelius, that didn't happen. The, the other problem with Aurelius, which is why this text is so poignant about faith, is that Aurelius had a lot of faith in his brother, who was inept and a sort of party boy. He had a lot of faith in his wife, who cheated on him. And he had a lot of faith in his son Commodus, who was designated as the heir apparent even when he was a child. And Commodus was a bad person. And of course the movie Gladiator brings out that Commodus was a bad person. But Commodus didn't murder his dad. He was only 16 years old at the time that his dad dies. But see, that was the big failing of his dad. He had faith, all right, but in all the wrong things. You see how Peter's text is so illuminating about the time, and you see how much we're missing in our Bible teaching because we don't know the meter, which is applying to the time. And this is very classical Greek style of writing to make a wry commentary on the time. This is how all the classical Greek playwrights did it. They'd use catchy little deft phrases like here, diapisteus, to characterize something going on in politics at the time the playwright's writing his play. This is their style. Peter knows Greek drama extremely well. And he's getting short shrift by scholars who say that his Greek was terrible. No, the scholars don't understand Greek themselves. Because this is Peter's style, and he's emulating the Greek playwrights. I don't care which Greek playwright you read, whether it's Aristophanes or Euripides or, or uh, whatchamacallit, the other guy. Well, even in the Romans, Plotinus, he was a little more bald. They all did this kind of writing. Okay, Shakespeare sort of emulates it sometimes with some of the cute things that he's saying. And, of course, that would even have more resonance if the real Shakespeare was really Edward de Vere, okay, who was a nobleman. Because a lot of Shakespearean writing is a satire on the times also. Okay, Dia Pisteos, that was everything that was wrong with Marcus Aurelius, and he prided himself on his faith. He was also a very religious guy, 
Okay, he supported all the Roman state religions, and he also supported, you know, persecuting Christians, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was like Trajan had said, don't ask, don't tell. If they make obnoxious fools of themselves, then yes, you have to bring them into court, try them, give them the opportunity to recant and kill them. That policy of Trajan's continued through Antoninus Pius and through Marcus Aurelius. Okay, most of the troublesome nature of the Christians is because they weren't following the Bible. See, this is a word, Visteos, Pistis, Bible. Bible. Contract of what God will do. Bible. On deposit. It's a commercial term. So you have faith in it because it's on deposit in the temple of the God. And the God is saying he's going to live up to the terms of the contract. The contract is Bible. Okay, well, the people, the Christians, and the Jews for that matter, of this period in history, starting here at 161 AD, they were just unbelievably, how do you want to call it, apostate. Every kind of lie, every kind of obnoxiousness that you can imagine happening in Christianity today, was happening then. The apostasy was at an all-time high. It just got worse and worse and worse from the time Revelation was completed in 90, 94 AD in our terms, 91 AD by, by John's own dating system. From the time it was completed, Christianity went into the tank. And that's the story that Paul and Peter are telling. But starting here in particular, you got Irenaeus and Tertullian. Tertullian was just a kid at this time. So it was mostly Irenaeus. And you got Hippolytus. You got a bunch of real disgusting Christian father jerks writing all kinds of lies, demonstrating how they know nothing, absolutely nothing, about the Old Testament or the New. Hegesippus was writing during this time. Hegesippus thought that James was supposed to be the successor to Jesus. He didn't understand the Jewish priesthood at all, and he certainly didn't understand the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is all about how Jesus couldn't be the successor priest. It's a whole new priesthood that's patterned after Psalm 110, Kata Melchizedek, not Kata the, the Jewish priesthood. Hegesippus didn't know anything about the Old Testament priesthood, and he didn't know anything about the book of Hebrews. Hegesippus was one of the stupidest people on earth, and he's the guy who invented the first bishop's list, which Irenaeus just, you know, blindly uses. I'm telling you, if you want to see how stupid and retarded Christianity is, read the church fathers. And in the second generation of church fathers, you have idiots like, total idiots like, Justin Martyr, okay, Hegesippus, Irenaeus, stupid Hermas, just, he's just a complete idiot, Tatian, Theophilus, of course he, he was just born at that point, so he becomes an idiot later, Athenagoras, he dies in 177, okay, Clement of Alexandria, but he was just a young kid then, but really, Tertullian and Irenaeus, because those are the two most prolific writers. Irenaeus is one of the most disgusting jerks I've ever had to read. And yet he's praised by Christians in Catholicism and Calvinism today. He was a total jerk. And he lies. He just loves lying. Lying means nothing to him. Hegesippus was just stupid. Okay, so they all have their faith in the wrong place, just like, see, Peter's drawing parallel to the apostate, disgusting Christians who didn't have any faith in the Bible, but had faith in their own lies, and the faith that Marcus Aurelius had in his own lies, in his own Greek philosophy, and in his own family and, and friends, who were really bad for Rome. And so what does God do? What does God have to do when apostasy among Christians is so bad and when Rome itself is so badly governed? I mean, see, this is the problem. The Roman historians then and now were praising Marcus Aurelius. Okay? The Roman 
the Roman, you know, believers then and now were praising the apostate, disgusting Christians who were prolifically writing during that time, showing how ignorant they were of Bible. Okay? What does God have to do? God has to do something to disrupt. Disrupt all this bad faith. When it gets to a boiling point, when it gets so bad that it's not going to improve everybody so corrupt, he brings on a plague. That's Leviticus 26. That's what happened to Egypt. Leviticus 26 says, hi, bad stuff's going to happen to you when you're apostate. Deuteronomy 28 says the same thing. So that's what God is doing. He's cleaning house. It's a heads up to all the Roman pagans. Hi, all of your faith in all the wrong things is bringing upon you a plague. And where does the plague come from? The East. And what area in the East? Parthia. And what was characteristic of Parthia in the East? There were a lot of Christians there. There, there was a frequent thing that there were Christians there. Good Christian population and a bad Christian population. So the troops brought the plague with them and it never leaves Rome. It will continue to show up in Rome for the next hundred years. Okay? Starting right here. So isn't that something that over faith in wrong or right objects the plague comes to Rome under Aurelius. The very year he gets in power, this stuff starts to begin. The actual plague hits around 166 AD, so right around here. Okay? Dia, two syllables, Pisteus. Dia, Pisteus. Five syllables, 161, 166, right here. That's when it actually the troops come home because they're victorious finally in Parthia and that's when they bring the plague with them. So now look at how, how awesome the rest of the text is. Okay? A lot of people are what? Dying dying from what? The plague that came from where? Parthia, which included of course the territory of Judea and Syria. By the time they're victorious, that's all one unit. Or all under Roman control. Okay, so now look. When you're dying, you're face to face with needing what? Salvation. And what kind of salvation do you need it? Well, it's prepared to be revealed. Yeah, because you're in the moment of death. Last call. What's going to save you from this body of death? Apostate believer who's dying of the plague. What's going to save you from this body of death? pagan Roman who wouldn't listen to the real message of Christ. Because even an apostate at least gets a few things right. All right? So yeah, because of the plague, everything's being revealed to Rome. To Rome and her environs. Everywhere the troops marched, they brought the plague with them. All the way from Parthia in the east, think of the territory around Babylon all the way from there, all the way to Rome. So all between the east and the west, everywhere the troops went, they spread the plague with them. So a whole lot of people were dying, and a whole lot of people therefore needed saving, and they needed it right then while it was prepared to believe in Christ. Because why? It's now revealed to you that you're about to die. That's pretty strict wording in Peter, don't you think? Because the plague would continue to go on. This is when it started in 166, and it would keep on breaking out for the rest of this time. And our boy Aurelius himself dies right there at 180. Okay? And this is when Commodus takes over. And so a whole lot of people thought, well, these are the last days, baby. The last times. Everybody's going to die now. Because Commodus was a real stinky ruler. He killed people, you know, on a whim. He was he was a really bad ruler. Okay? So anybody who wasn't dying of the plague would be dying of the edicts of Commodus. 
Okay, and there was the persecution of Christians during this time also. In fact, it was brought on by the fact that the plague came because Romans were really superstitious people. I mean, unbelievably superstitious. You need to read up on, you know, what their religions were. That, you know, odd days versus even days. And then they wouldn't have a certain number of days in a month because that would have portents. And if a raven flew and knocked down a statue, or if a raven flew and sat on a statue, everything had some kind of meaning. And they were reading entrails and they were just really goofball, superstitious people. So when the plague started hitting in 166, who got blamed? The Christians. And what were Christians doing during this time? They were being really obnoxious. And they had really goofball beliefs themselves. They were trying to compete with the faith of Aurelius by reconciling the Bible with philosophy. That was a chief characteristic of the writing by Christians during this period, apostasy. The chief kind of apostasy that it was, was to try and reconcile the Bible with um, Greek philosophy. They were all trying to prove themselves smart. Just like Christians today trying to argue about evolution, as if that made them smart. <coughs> I'm going to have to stop now. And I'm going to come back and pick this up in the next increment. Signing off for a moment.